All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yeah. Amen. I figured I better preach. The clock's going to get away on me. We've been talking about the nine gifts of the Spirit, and we uh, were dealing with the last time the working of miracles. And I'm going to finish some things up on that, but then we're going to get into the gifts of healing. Now, uh, the working of miracles and the gifts of healing. But I want to read this because I want us to understand where we're at. I don't read the verses over and over because I have nothing else to say. Matter of fact, I have more notes than I can get to at any given week. So it's not like I'm, uh, I'm not well prepared for this. Uh, so... I read this because it's important for us to continue to understand what's going on. All right. Verse four. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit of God is given to each one for the profit of all. For the one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit to another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by the same spirit to another, the working of miracles by this to another working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another different kinds of tongues or different kinds of tongues to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things distributed to each one individually as he wills. Now, talking about the working of miracles and the gifts of healing, I want to uh, finish some things with that. We begin to look at the New Testament on the working of miracles. So uh, in that last part, in the three areas that we call the power gifts, so there was nine of them. Uh, I'm repeating this because not everybody has been here. And those who goes back and get the audios or goes to Spotify or whatever. Nine gifts of the Spirit. Three reveal something. They're called revelation gifts. We talked about that. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning spirits. Three do something which are power, which is the, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, and the gift of faith. That's what we're dealing with now. Then we'll talk about three that, that says something. That would be tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and, and prophecy. So we're dealing with three gifts that do something. So when it comes to the working of miracles, uh, we're dealing with things that are miraculous. God does things that are miraculous in his nature. A miracle can be defined as a supernatural intervention by God in the ordinary course of of nature or it's a supernatural intervention something that that interrupts the ordinary Joshua chapter 10 when uh when God calls the sun to stand still for a whole day there was an interruption of the course of nature how many knows that the sun rises in the east it sets in the west And it happens that way every day. You can count on it. Somebody could call me and say, Pastor, I had a vision. I had a vision that tomorrow morning the sun was going to rise in the west. I'm thinking, you had more than a vision. (laughs) That was more than a vision. No, it rises in the east and it sets in the west. And how many knows it's on a continual move? But in this situation, God put a stop to it. It stood still for almost a day so that God's people could win the battle. It was a miracle that that sun stood still. As as, uh, Terry Mize was teaching in the mornings, talking about things that are spectacular and versus things that are supernatural or things that are miraculous. You know, we say things like, uh, I got an A on my test. That's a miracle. No, no, that's not a miracle because anybody could study enough 
to get an A on the test. Now, it may have been a miracle for me, uh, but to know it's not even a miracle. And, uh, but the point is, a miracle is when God supernaturally interrupts the course of nature. And that, that, that happens. And so, but when you're looking at this miracle part, a miracle, therefore, it says is a supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature, a temporary suspension of the accustomed order or an interruption by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is where the Holy Spirit can interrupt and do things. Now, a miracle is not always healing. It can deal with the physical, but miracles happen like the River Jordan stopping, the Red Sea crossing. That is a miracle. And I believe he deals with this, the working of miracles and the gifts of healing, as we begin to talk about it, like the woman's meal never ran out. Never ran out. Or the woman that uh, was ready to, uh, uh, they were going to come and take her two sons because uh, the, the husband was dead. She was a widow woman. She couldn't pay the debt. And they were going to take her kids as ransom money. And the prophet says, what do you have? I like his story. She's like a lot of people. He said, what do you have? You know what she says? Nothing. And that's what we get messed up at. Nothing except this little oil. That's all I have. How many knows God can take what you have and continue to multiply it? So to make a long story shorter, he said, go have your sons go borrow vessels. Don't borrow just a few. Have them borrow a vessel. And then when you take that, take those vessels, go in and close the door and begin to pour that in those vessels. As they went in there and began to pour, that little bit of oil retained just a little bit of oil. And the more they poured, the more they poured, the more they poured, the more they poured, until every vessel was full, And they were still with that little bit of oil. Now, how many knows that is a miracle? Nobody got healed. Her life was rescued. And we like to look at miracles like something instantly happened. Someone has a back pain. They're bent over. And all of a sudden, you pray and they stand up and shout, praise God, and we say, We experienced a miracle today. Well, that wasn't a miracle. That was just a good healing. Amen? That was a good healing. But a miracle is something that we look at. And so we looked at different aspects. But I want to look at some things in the New Testament when it comes to the working of miracles. And then we'll move into healings because we didn't get to finish the a thing on the working of, of miracles. Go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Acts 6. Let those pages turn. So we gave a lot of examples in the Old Testament. If you were not here, we, we gave examples out of 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter, uh, well, we talked about 2 Kings chapter 6, but we didn't read, read the verse, and, uh, and then we uh, talked about the, uh, Jesus turning the water into wine. How many knows that's a miracle? If you were not here, I talked about it, about the wine, because an argument always, did he turn it into the fruit of the vine, or did he turn it into fermented wine and I, I i went into some of that and uh you can get that if you ever take the new members class you can get into that more uh but i want you to go back and look at some of these new testament stories about miracles and find something because there's no way that we have enough time for me to go talk about every miracle that transpired in the new testament in the old testament about how many knows that uh, i have never ever thrown a rock into the lake where the rock began to float 
Anybody ever thought it's on a rock end? The best I've ever done is skip one across. But you got to have a good flat rock to skip it across. How many's ever skipped a rock? And it skipped across over the other side. Was that a miracle? No. No, that's just some kind of a, that's just come some kind of a force of science. Amen. Uh, but when you throw a rock in, it creates a splash. And the rock goes to the bottom. What about if you're cutting down a tree and the axe head comes off of the handle and next thing you know, the axe is borrowed. You can read the story in the book of 2 Kings 6. The axe is borrowed. And how many knows when you borrow something, you borrow because you don't have one. And if you had the money to buy one, you wouldn't have to borrow one. <laughs> Come on. The reason why we borrow things is because we don't have things. And the reason why we don't have it is because we can't afford it. The reason why people borrow a truck is they don't have one. And the reason why most people don't have one is because they can't afford one. You borrow something that you don't have. And all of a sudden, this axe head was borrowed. So apparently he borrowed it because he didn't have one. He didn't have one because he couldn't afford one. And all of a sudden, God shows up when you can't do anything. And the axe head comes flying off. And it goes to the bottom of the river. How many knows that's the way it works? Steel, iron, goes to the bottom of the river. But God through the prophet, created a miracle where the axe head began to float. How many knows there's nothing natural about that? And the man was so sincere, master, master, <laughs> the axe head's in the water. I don't know what to do. It was borrowed. Thank God that the axe head that was borrowed came back. And how many knows that was a miracle? That was a miracle. If you threw a rock in the water and it began to float, people will tell you there's no way that's possible. You took some type of piece of styrofoam and you painted it to look like a rock and you carried it like it was heavy like a rock and you, you looked like you tossed it like a rock. But the truth was it wasn't a rock because rocks don't float, neither does iron. But when God interrupts that natural law we have something called now a miracle and God still does miracles aren't you glad God still does miracles I'm thankful for that amen I'm thankful for that you know I made a statement I need to stay on course here uh, I made a statement one time because the church of Jesus Christ we're all wrapped up in miracles we want to see miracles actually they're looking at miracles of healing We'll, we'll, we'll get to some of that because some of it does apply to healing. We want to see miracles in the house of God. You know, I would, that we never would have or ever, ever have to see a miracle in this house with God's people unless the world came in and needed a miracle. You know why we need a miracle? Because the axe head fell off the head and it wasn't off the stick and it wasn't ours. And the only way to get it back is a miracle. You know why you need a financial miracle? Because no way possible can you get out of it unless God intervenes. How, how would you like to live a walk with God where you never needed a miracle? Because the blessing of God was always so strong upon you that you never, ever needed a miracle. You're always so blessed financially, you never needed a financial blessing. Come on. I would that we'd never have to have one for the body of Christ in the church because we live blessed we didn't need a miracle healing because we lived whole oh, nothing missing nothing broken would that be awesome yes. so even though I love miracles I wish we never have to see one because we have to see them when there's no other option come on that means a miracle God has to show up in a supernatural way manifest in a supernatural now he could do a miracle like like if he wanted to to show himself alive but i'm talking about people saying need a miracle i get a call pastor i gotta have a miracle if i don't have a miracle financial breakthrough by such and such time i'm done how many know that is a bad place to be but when the blessing of god is upon his people like it was on abraham isaac and jacob the bible said the blessing of the lord maketh rich that doesn't mean millionaire. That means 
full supply of and left over. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and adds what? No sorrow. How many knows poverty and lack is sorrowful? Is adds sorrow. So when somebody calls and says, if God doesn't create a miracle in this situation because you can't go get a job for it, you sold everything you have, you couldn't get out of it. So it's not like you have, you have no way possible to escape this. So God somehow supernaturally, supernaturally moves and puts money in your hand that would take you a lifetime to go work for to get you out of a situation that may have been part of your fault getting into it, and it may not have, but you have a miracle. But wouldn't it have been great to sleep at night and have no sorrow because you never had to have one because the blessing of the Lord was so great upon your life? Come on. Divine life is so great on your life that sickness and disease can't take a hold of it. God told his people, if you obey my word, keep my commandment, I'll take sickness away from the midst of you. And the number of your days I will fulfill. How many knows that's the way that God wants us to live? So to me, even though I understand miracles, even though I understand what's going on, I would that the body of Christ would live so blessed in God that we could just take this and show the world this power so that they could experience a God greater than anything they've ever seen. Amen. It's called signs and wonders. You know what a sign and wonder is? See, here's what happens. People said, without signs and wonders, they'll never, people need it to be born again. Well, there is a truth to that. Miracles become a dinner bell to God. But I've said this for years. They saw the sign and they wonder. Signs and wonders are, they saw the sign. And they wondered. But how many knows wondering doesn't get you anywhere? They saw the signs and wondered. But they heard the word and believed. So if you're going to have signs and wonders, you better have to preach them the word so people can believe. They saw the sign and wondered. Like the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost fully came, how many know they saw the sign and they wondered? These men are drunk. But Peter stood up and said, we're not drunk as you think drunk, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Come, How many knows? They saw the signs and wonders, but they heard the word, and then they believed. Don't go with signs and wonders unless you got the word of God to go with it, because it takes the word to create faith. Amen? Woo, I'm preaching real good. Even on a fatigued, uh, jet-lagged brain. Hallelujah. It's a miracle. No, it's not a miracle. (laughs) Dear God, it's a miracle that I can't stay. I need a miracle to stay on track. Acts chapter 6. Don, will you you quit distracting me up here? (laughs) Acts chapter 6. Now, there are different things that begin to transpire here. And uh, and in Acts chapter 6, you... You, you can see some things here that, that, that begin to, uh, let me see here. Let me try to see if I can, a verse that I want to get on that better. Uh, go to, I, I could tell that, not, not, not that I read it and it wasn't there. I just looked at the verse and I said it wasn't right. Go, go, to, go to Acts chapter 8, verse 6. I think I'm going to like that better. <clears throat> 8, 6. Well, let me just, you stay at 8.6. That's what I'm going to read. But I'm going to be at, I'm going to just start at verse 1 because let's not start in the middle of the uh, letter here, even though we are so far. Now Saul, which became who? Paul. Was consenting to his death. At that time, great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria Except the apostles. They stayed there. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. And made great lamentation or they wept over him. Now what happened here in chapter 7. Deacon Stephen or Stephen. Was stoned to death by religious people. 
but he went out pretty good. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing in ovation at the right hand of God. And Paul was giving consent to this. He held the coats of those who stoned Stephen. This is what, can you imagine that a deacon is not just to help you break leaves or pay your bill, but deacons have a qualification to be full of wisdom, honest report, and the Holy Ghost. This was a deacon that preached the gospel so blistering that they stopped their ears. They stopped their ears so he wouldn't go on. I'm telling you what, when you have people serving the house of God that walks in the anointing, supernatural things begin to happen. Amen. All right. That's another sermon. Don, leave me alone. <clears throat> All right. So uh, they l- lamented over his body. Verse three, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went throughout preaching the word. Huh. Huh. Notice what persecution did. It got things moving. Come on. But you notice something. I wonder what brought them to that point. Well, persecution. No, it was disobedience, really. Because I love the correspondence here. In Acts 1 8, he said, When you receive the Holy Ghost, you're going to be witness unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the other most parts of the earth. That's what, the, that's what he told him to do. Now, when you look at this, persecution was in Judea and Samaria. They didn't obey Acts 1-8. So when Acts 8, 1, 2, and 3 came along, they got to preaching. So I would be obedient on the first command, maybe to keep you out of persecution on the back end. Just maybe. <laughs> Come on. God's serious about his great commission. That's just a little side thought. All right. That's not even my text yet, but we're getting there. They were scattered. Verse five. Then Philip, another deacon, turned evangelist. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. How many knows he, they were commanded to go to Judea and Samaria to begin with? So Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. What do you mean preach Christ? Yes, Jesus loves you. No, he preached about the Messiah, the anointed one, and how the anointing came to set people free. And the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So not all miracles are flag, are uh, axe heads floating, rivers, you know, dividing, Red Seas dividing. There are miracles that begin to transpire in this way here. So uh, them seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cried out with a loud voice. How many has ever seen unclean spirits cry out with a loud voice? You know, Back in the day, whatever the day means, only old people say that. We'd have to ask some of you seasoned people. (laughs) You know, America used to be filled with tent revival meetings. Great revivalist healings. They would lay hands on the sick. How many here was ever in an Oral Roberts meeting? Look at it. Some of these more seasoned people over here. You had people like Oral Roberts, A.E. Allen, William Branham. Miracles everywhere. It wasn't just miracles. I'm talking about people were healed, but devils came out. You know, I start asking pastors in America... It's sad that, that uh, in one air, in one aspect, because there's this mentality that uh, no one in America is demon-possessed. 
Well, I've seen some Christians sure act like it. Somebody asked Brother Hagin one time, can a Christian have a demon? He said, according to the Bible, a Christian can have whatever he desires. Whatever you desire one, you can have one. Whatever you desire. Now, if you stay possessed of God, there's no room to be possessed of a devil. Come on. But that doesn't mean one can't, a spirit can't get in your flesh. But it can't get into you, you spirit. Come on. I told you about the house I lived in at Eaton that was infested with roaches. You turned the light on, the floor moved. No matter how many times you sprayed, fumigated, or bombed it, not <laughs> bombed, you know, you couldn't kill those things. It's like they were invincible. They ran us out of the house. But it's amazing. We lived in that house with those roaches, but the roaches never got in us. Thank God. And you know, there are spirits of infirmities that can get in this house, this body, but they can't get into you. The real you, the spirit. Am I making sense? Praise God. I can only be possessed by one spirit, and it is the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's only room for one, and I'm not going to give space to another. Amen. I'm not giving space to another one. But I started asking pastors. This is where I was at. When's the last time you cast out a devil? Oh, I ain't never cast out a devil. Sometimes we try to cast out flesh. That don't work. If I could cast out flesh... Some of you would have a whole lot happier life. I mean, uh, there's uh, people I know would have a whole lot happier life. (laughs) You can't cast out flesh. You know what you do with flesh? You crucify it. Paul said, I crucify the flesh daily. I crucify the flesh daily. You can't cast it out. But I had one, I've had people tell me, why? There's no... There, we, we don't have that in America. There's no demons like that in America. People don't get like that in America. I have people tell me that. And so now we create jokes like, the only demons in America are the ones who couldn't make the team in Africa. No. No. Some of you are just getting it. But I've seen them cry out. Cry out. I've heard them say, I'm not coming out. I said, shut up, you're coming out. And then they get emboldened. Well, who are you? I don't give them my resume or my pedigree or my diplomas. You know what I say simply? You know who I am. Now in the name of Jesus, shut up and come out. Because Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? See, they ought to know. Not based upon your words. They ought to know based upon your authority. Come on. And I'm still not hardly to my text, but we're going to get there. And the multitude was one accord, heeded to the things which uh, spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirit, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lames were healed. So I don't know exactly what the miracles look like, but it says he, there were miracles that took place, but then healings took place. And the kind of healings that it noted, it was those who were paralyzed and those who were lame. So now, if we transition or segue into the gifts of healing, which we won't dive real deep into it. Since it's a supernatural gift from God by the Holy Ghost. The gift of healing may operate in someone and they may have more success in one area or certain areas of elements than they do other areas. Like here, God wrought special miracles by Philip, by the hands of Philip, uh, people seeing and hearing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits came out, that's by the name of Jesus. But those who were paralyzed and lame begin to walk. How many knows that deals with the limbs? Paralyzed and lame begin to walk. So there's a chance, I'm not saying it's the only thing, that maybe Philip had more success 
or the anointing or the gift of healing that he operated in was dealing with people walking. Are you with me? I've heard people say that when the anointing of God is upon me, I get, I can get more blind eyes open than anybody he knows. But it's hard to get someone delivered of, healed of cancer. But the blinded eye, it's like there's a supernatural thing on them. Blind eye and deaf ears. If you were in Don's class, and I think you did the book on healing, or the gifts of the spirit, or the gifts of the spirit, or whatever. I think he said that, Brother Hagin said, the gift of healing when it operated in his life, that it seemed like he had more success with tumors and growths than anything else. You remember reading that? Like people got healed of many other things, but he had more success than that. There was a period of my ministry and uh, I took note of it. As a matter of fact, I took note of it and taught it that it seemed like people with blood disorders were getting healed one after another. But it didn't stay that way forever. Remember the story I told you about the elderly lady that I was preaching in this church and she was a Baptist lady. She called I was preaching for her nephew and she called him that day and said, I'm going to come to church. But she didn't tell him she had a guest speaker because uh, he knew that she wouldn't come. And that's when uh, I still have her picture. I still have the article that I wrote to, to put in my, uh, the newsletter I wrote then. And uh, she came and I usually pray for the oldest and the one that seemed like they can't stand the longest first so they can get back. But when I stepped up in front of them, it's almost like, I didn't even see her and I started praying for the one on her right and I went all the way down to the end because multiple people were praying and they left and it's like I bypassed her, went all the way down to my, to my right, her left and they came back and she's still standing there by herself. And when I laid hands on her, I heard myself say, the secret place, the hidden place. The anointing of God goes to that which is hidden. And people boo-hoo and woo hoo And I got done praying. And uh, the pro- pastor I was pre- preaching for, her nephew said, uh, Aunt so-and-so, did you hear what the Lord said to you? And uh, come to find out that she had leukemia. And she was having all these blood transfusions at the same time, and they didn't know where the blood was going. No matter what they did on scans, it said it was like a mystery. As things were hidden from them. And not only did the power of God go into her and she never lost any more blood, she was totally healed of that blood disease called leukemia. It seemed like everyone I laid hands on during that period of time, if there was anything in the blood, they were healed. If I had my way, I'd do it all the time. Anything that dealt with blood, disease, infection is like, bam. And I know it wasn't me that did it, But there was something about that that God just put up on me for that season of time. Now, according to this, people that were paralyzed and lame begin to walk. It doesn't say those, those were tumors and gross. And I'm not saying they didn't. But I'm just saying when the gifts of healing comes up on you... Uh, you may be used of God in certain areas and not in other areas. I, I, I know people that hardly ever pray for the sick. That's not their deal. They'll tell you, you have somebody else pray for the sick. I'm here to pray for anybody who wants to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because there's this gift upon them. No matter who they lay hands upon, it seems like they get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Anybody ever heard of that? It didn't matter what they did, they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And so they said, I don't pray for people. I'll pray for somebody by faith. I'll mix my faith with them. But I don't just hold healing lines, even though I know Jesus is the healer. Why? Because when this anointing is upon me, it's for people to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. When we learn to flow with God, things begin to change all the way and through our life. Amen? Things will begin to change through our life. And so uh, uh, miracles are right. Chapter 15. Let me get a couple more verses in here. Before the clock tells me to shut up. <clears throat> chapter 15. This is a, a, great, a great chapter uh, here. Let 
Let's just go right to uh, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. Declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them amongst the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to, the, listen to me. Uh, so God uses people in the gift of working of miracles. The feeding of 5,000, was that a miracle? We talked about that the last time. Come on. Uh, you have, was it five fish and two loaves? Did you see those pictures? There's some of them fish that I took a picture of was like, was, was like is. Why, why, why would a little boy be carrying a fish this big? Five of them anyway. And actually, it wasn't five fish like five big crappie. It'd be like five minnows. Actually, five little sardines. And the crackers, the bread was like crackers. And uh, and uh, did we get that backwards? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it was when I read, when I said, said that I, I knew I knew it wasn't right. It's good that you know enough you can catch yourself. <laughs> Amen. But it's like these crackers. It's like these little matter of fact uh, these just little small crackers. So there's a couple of sardines and crackers. How many knows there's no way you can feed is a kid's lunch. It wasn't even a man's lunch. You give me two little fish and five little crackers, that's not even an hors d'oeuvre. And he fed 5,000. Is that just a story? Is it real? Then he fed four more thousand. So when you say 5,000 plus men and women, I mean, (laughs) women and children. I probably should have stopped 10 minutes ago. (laughs) But he fed them with that little bit of fish and loaves. Now, to me, no one was healed in that story about that. But that was a miracle. Just like the oil never running out. But there were 12 baskets left over. And then when he fed the 4,000, how many baskets left over? Anybody remember? I think seven baskets. Uh, Am I right? Seven baskets left over. You know, every time Jesus did a miracle like that, there was always something left over. More than enough. I preached a message called, uh, talking about uh, breaking out of breaking even. Breaking out of breaking even. You know, some people, faith works, and some people just believe for just enough. Believe for just enough. I've heard so many testimonies, and I believe they're real. And I heard, I heard some again, even on this trip. People on missions trips or whatever are at a soup kitchen in inner city, and they expect 200 people, but 500 people show up. And they're praying, God, may it not run out to the last person. And it's like the last person come, the last sandwich and the last dipper of soup is gone. Now, how many knows that's supernatural? Yes. And, uh, and then when I started seeing everything Jesus multiplied, it was never the last dipper. There was always plenty left over. I can't find one place where it was a break-even deal with Jesus. Because he said seeds multiply. I've never seen a break-even place with Jesus. And people say, well, then why, then why is there more testimonies about the last sandwich, the last bowl? Because that's where your faith was. That's where your faith was. That's where your faith was. You didn't even know you could believe for more than enough. Why would you need an extra pot of soup? You just needed enough to feed the people. But you, your faith really works. Faith really works. But when it comes to the miracle working part of God, come on. When it comes to two fish and five loaves, when it comes to, to just crackers and, and uh, minnows, when it comes to just whatever it is, God's got a way to work it all out. Come on. 
He's got a way to work it out. Uh, so I really believe in the supernatural, and I believe that we have the right to see the supernatural. And so we're going to get into, let me read one more verse, and then we'll get into more. The next, the, not next Wednesday, we'll have the candlelight service, but the following Wednesday, we're going to get into the gifts of healing. Now I want you to, if you want to read that, it's the only gifts out of the nine that's plural. The working of miracles, it's the work of miracles, miracles as there, as there meant many. But now, the gift of working of miracles, the gift, singular, working of miracles. But this is the gifts of healing. So why is it plural? We're going to talk about the plurality of it and t- talk about that there. And so, uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 11 of Acts. Most of you know this verse. And God worked special or unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left them and evil spirits went out of them. So God did do special miracles then and God will do special miracles today. Amen. All right, let's stand together.